Hi, I am Steve Burns. Um, but uh, if you know me at all, you might know me as Steve with um, just one name, Steve, like Prince or Madonna, but totally different because you probably know me as Steve from Blue's Clues, which uh, was a very educational children's television show in the 90s. And, and we'll get to that. Um, but let's talk about you just for a second. Um, this must have been a crazy couple of years for you as an educator. I mean, I can't even imagine how difficult that must have been. It's like society sort of tasked you with like holding civilization together in a lot of ways, in ways that just were completely bizarre and unfair. And you had to use all of these tools that were not, uh, that you were not used to, to sort of create uh, what is ultimately a, an interpersonal experience, right? Education is ultimately um, an interpersonal experience where knowledge is passed from one human being to another. Um, and it just must have been really, really hard. I know a bunch of teachers, they were really going through it. And I just want to say how, um, how honored I am to be able to talk to you about it and, uh, um, and just how much I admire what you guys do and what you must have had to do over these last couple of years and continue to do. In fact, a little bit about me, like I admire educators so much. In fact, I went to a tiny little college in, uh, in a cornfield in Pennsylvania, a little Catholic university in the Eastern United States. And um, I was a theater major, right? I was about to quit being a theater major because I thought this is cool and this is fun, but this is not a way a human being can make a living. This is a strange thing to do with your life. And what I was gonna do is quit and become a teacher. That was my honest intention. But just as I was about to do that, I randomly won uh, a national acting award. And uh, because of that, uh, there was like a little flurry of interest in me in New York City as an actor. Like I had an agent and a manager. Um, and uh, my girlfriend at the time was like, you're an idiot. You should at least go try that before you quit that. The rest of us are still trying to get agents. You're ahead of the game. So I went to New York City to be a very gritty actor, to be Al Pacino, to be Dustin Hoffman, to be a little dangerous, gritty actor. If, I think Blue's Clues was my second audition. <laughs> and so I was immediately this guy. And um, I thought, right, I thought that Blue's Clues was going to be um, a voice audition, like to be the voice of a cartoon. I don't know that I even would have gone to the audition if I had known that it was going to be this host of a kid show because I never in a million years expected or um, anticipated or even thought about being on a children's television show. So when I went to the audition and there was a camera in the room, I thought, oh boy, I better do something. So I looked at the script and the script was like, a, it was like a game show, essentially, right? Like, which one is the triangle? You guessed it. Good job. And I said, no, no, no I'm going to act the hell out of this. I'm going to Dustin Hoffman this script. And I made it this like really personal thing. Instead of being like, which one is it? I was like, which one is it? Do you, do you know? Like we were like buddies. Like it was like a, like a conspiratorial moment, like a parenthetical moment between you and me. And then I was like, oh yeah, you're right. Great job. So I made it this like personal relationship. I didn't think that would work. And then they showed that to kids and kids poof, broke out and lost their minds. And then Blue's Clues kind of took off. And here's why I'm telling you all that. I immediately realized that I wasn't that my role on that show while I was acting it, I was actually an educator. Blue's Clues 
is was brilliantly conceived. Angela Santamaro, Tracy Johnson, the people who created Blue's Clues, brilliant, brilliant people. Every beat of that show, every moment of that show, the repetition, the way that it is an homage to Fred Rogers, the, the, the way that it is structured, it's all a brilliant curriculum. That's what Blue's Clues was, a curriculum for preschoolers. And my real job was to facilitate that curriculum. And I was like, oh, so now I'm an educator accidentally. But I felt really weird about it because I hadn't studied education. I was not a child development specialist. I was not a teacher. But my job now was to teach, was to educate, was to facilitate this curriculum. And I felt totally um, underqualified. And I used to say to them all the time, like, this is great and I'm glad it's so successful, but don't you think this should be a teacher doing this? Don't you think this should be a child development specialist or an educator doing this? So I always felt wrong footed and I always felt sort of um, miscast in, in, in that role. So flash forward to now and the same thing is happening to you, right? You're an educator, and now they're saying to you, be entertaining through this lens. Be compelling, hold attention, develop attention, lead, teach, do the interpersonal thing this way. And it occurred to me, like, just as I, even as I was driving here, that we're in, we were in similar straits, but just kind of backwards, right? I was an unlikely educator, and now you guys, in a way, are being asked to be um, unlikely entertainers, in a sense. Because, and I say that because, because of the conventions that, that we're using, right? We're using this screen, and we're using a camera. Again, I'm not a child development specialist. This is just what I'm assuming, but it seems to me that that students are highly conditioned to screens as things that entertain them, as things that, um, that they are sort of passively entertained by. Kids have such a comfort level with technology, but it doesn't strike me, it doesn't seem to me in, in talking to my teacher friends that that, that that comfort level, that that familiarity with technology really translates into a comfort level with with, with the screen. So it must be so difficult to be trying to communicate with people on these really difficult levels. It's hard to teach people things. And it must be so difficult to do that through the screen with people who are used to sort of zoning out. Also, the, 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 uh, the separation with the camera and the computer and everything, it, it, it seems to me that it would create a very low stakes environment for a student, right? Where they can kind of like tune out and like whatever, they can Google the answer. You know, their, their presence does not include necessarily the possibility of failure the way it would in a class, which can also be super highly motivating. I don't have the answer to any of this, but, but I can tell you what I did, right? I can give you my recipe for um, what I call uh, immediacy, right? Um, how, how can we create a sense of immediacy through this highly mediated form, through this highly mediated environment? So Blue's Clues was based on a lot of uh, really compelling research out of the University of Massachusetts by this guy named Dan Anderson. And what he was really studying was uh, attention, especially very young um, People, when they watch television, there's so much attention given to it. And TV has an ability to hold attention. You've all seen kids zone out in front of a TV, especially really young ones. And we were trying to figure out what that was about. I read some of this research. And, and one thing that, that he pointed out was the concept of dynamic fluctuation, right? We know what that is, right? That's uh, something really loud followed by something really quiet, followed by something really loud or something really bright followed by something really dark followed by something really bright or i mean and we we know these dynamics they work in music that's every every nirvana song um and it occurred to me that hey i can use that 
to, I can use that as an actor. I can use those dynamics. I can use those pedals to hold attention around curricular moments. And the, my, the first thought I had, I based Steve almost entirely on Grover, right? So the first thought I had was, that's near far. That's near far. That's the dynamic, right? So Grover would be really near, and then he'd be really far away, and then he'd be really near. And that was my favorite as a kid. So what I did was whenever I would see a clue, when we'd have that moment in Blue's Clues where I'd be like, I don't see a clue. Where's the clue? And the kids would be like, it's over there. I would always prefer to run back and say, I don't see it. And then they'd say, it's over there. And then I'd get really close and say, where is it? Oh, it's over there. So that dynamic fluctuation would hold attention right when we needed it to, if, if that if that makes sense. And and you can fluctuate those dynamics. And the good news is, I believe that it's still kind of arresting for adults and young adults and uh, tweens. I think I think the cat. I think it is a good device to. Um, to maintain and develop attention with a lens, right? Um, and, I, and, and you can just do that in, in regular conversation. You, you can like actually start to make your point by fluctuating your dynamics and then fluctuating them again. So, and, and, and you can do it spatially, right? You can do it spatially. You can also do it uh, vocally. One thing I always did, another trick that I would always use, was uh, just pacing. I would talk really, 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 really fast, knowing that eventually I was going to slow down at certain points to create emphasis and hold attention. You can, you can imagine all the other ways that you can do that, you know, just with pausing and, and um, volume, obviously. But the real thing that I believe creates a sense of immediacy is if you can find a way to have sort of intentional dynamic shifts. That's a little actory. What I this is what I did. I don't know that it would be necessarily useful in an educational, in a straight educational standpoint, but the, the fluctuation that I would use the most was uh, a sense of wonder and a sense of vulnerability, right? That creates, because if the wonder is there, and you're really excited about something, but then you're kind of vulnerable about, are you going to help me find it? Okay, cool. Right? Like if, if, if that is there, that creates an authenticity, right? That creates a vulnerable moment where, um, it approximates an actual interpersonal relationship, if that makes sense. Another trick that I would use a lot, uh, Again, I'm not sure how well this translates, but it might in moments uh, was status, right? So I talked to the camera as always as though it was one person and right? never a group, even though you might be addressing a group. I and I knew that I was they told me I was addressing millions, but I I spoke as though I was always talking to one person in a very um, specific way. Uh, and the status that I used was that the home viewer, the person that I was talking to, was at a higher status than I was. So they were cooler than me, right? Um, and I was always, in a way, trying to impress them. And so if I got too excited, I would, like, you know, have to keep it cool because they're cooler than me. And, um, and if I asked for their help, I, like, I was always worried that they might say no. And I was always thrilled if they said yes because they were at a higher status than me. I don't think that necessarily applies to a student-teacher relationship, but the effect of that, the conceit of that across the whole television show was that we, that the home viewer and I were closer to peers, right? We, there was almost a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Um, and I, I wonder if there are moments of... Uh, using that dynamic through a camera that could really create engagement um, for teachers. And so the other, the other thing that I would do a lot was um, active listening, right? Um, Blue's Clues was different in 
than other kid shows. I mean, Fred Rogers spoke to the camera. A lot of children's television shows spoke to the camera. What I like to say that we did differently is we listened to it. I would ask a question and then I would imagine a re specific response. And I would do that in silence, right? And that is not the way that we're used to dealing with um, cameras and screens and things. And I think that that kind of cut through for that reason. I think it still kind of does. I just did a promo for, uh, for Nickelodeon that got like a zillion viral hits and stuff. And it was the same formula of listening. The way that I pretended essentially to listen, um, and this is just a little trick, is I would read the lens. Right. So inside of a lens, sometimes at least the lens that we used, it said Carl Zeiss and uh, it had little numbers on it and stuff. And so I would ask a question then I would literally just look for that and read it. And that creates a sense of active listening and then really imagining the response and really reacting to that response. Right. So if I say, um, so how is how is your day? So now I'm imagining that you're like, oh, actually it sucked. So I'm like, oh, yeah. You know, like really creating, investing in those moments in a way that feels real. It can't be that interpersonal in the room ping pong that we'd all want it to be, but it can approach that in ways. It doesn't have to feel as abstract and removed as it is. I don't know if, if those things... Um, are helpful or not, but that's just, uh, those are just sort of my little bag of tricks that I used for Blue's Clues. Um, and I hope that they are useful to you as an educator. Thanks. We just got a keynote. We just got a keynote. We just got a keynote. And it was really good. Wow. Big, big thank you to Steve Burns. I feel inspired, I feel moved. Heck, I wanna go teach somebody again right now. But first, we got a little something special. We have Steve here with us and we're gonna have a quick Q&A chat. Y'all ready? Let's do it. Hey, hey, Steve? Steve, it's me, <laughs> Marcus from Cami. How you doing, friend? Marcus. Hey, how have you been? It's great to see you. Good to see you too, friend. I got some questions for you. You ready? Oh, great, right. great. Hit me. I gotta be honest, friend. <laughs> I gotta be honest, I gotta oh, be honest. Do it. When you left Blue's Clues, I was shocked because you look so happy doing the job. And in my mind, I was like, why would somebody who clearly loves their job leave? And so my question for you is, what made you go but what made you come back? These are great questions. How old were you, Marcus, when I left Blue's Clues? Do you remember? I had to be about nine or 10. Okay, right. Because I was gonna say that's a slightly older um, reaction than I would expect from like a preschooler. But uh, you know, man, I mean, the real, real, why I left the show, I mean, I was just getting older. I was going bald, like super fast. And we didn't really have um, an elegant remedy for that. Uh, and, you know, it was getting to a point where no matter what I did, I was starting to phone it in a little, you know? I was in every take of every shot every day for all those seasons with no actors, no props really, unless I was holding it just on a blue screen. And it's, it, it was hard. And, you know, I'm really good friends with the new hosts of Blue's Clues, and it's hard for them too. It's a hard job, you know? Uh, not just for me, for the for the directors as well, and for for everyone. Like it, it's a it was a challenging thing, and um, I just felt like I had done what I could do there, and uh, I just needed to do something else. I needed to put my energy in in a different place. I did love it. You're not wrong about that, um, but I'm glad I left when I did. You know, I feel like I feel like it was the right time to do that. Cause you don't want to be, you don't want to be burned out. And I know, I know the educators out there understand, like you don't want to be burned out while you're trying to empower 
<laughs> you know what I mean? And it just felt like I was getting burned out. Um, and why did I come back is, uh, well, no one's asked me that yet. And that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I had, I had just completely gone off the grid, literally. Like I was living in an off-grid cabin in the Catskill Mountains. And there's a scene in Rambo, part two, I think, where uh, <laughs> the, the, the old military guy shows up and Rambo's like making a stone wall in Tibet or something. And he's like, John, we need you to come back. And he's like, I don't do that anymore. And like, no, John, your nation needs you. And he's like, I don't do that anymore, but okay. And it kind of felt like that because they were rebooting Blue's Clues and they were like, dude, there's only like five of us like who know what this show is. Can you please come back and help? And I was like, yeah, okay. And then I came back and was like, oh God, this is so fun. And it was so great. And I was working with the new guy. I helped find the new guy. And he's awesome. He's such a good dude. And he's so good at what he does. He's such a pleasure to work with. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to write a script. You know what? You should let me direct that script. And then like now I'm just like totally behind the scenes. Like, you know, um, and I, I always tell the new guy, Josh, I was like, I was like, I'm Yoda. Really? I'm smaller. I'm bald, I'm old and I'm green and I'm green. And like, and I, and I'm the OG who knew the force and I'm teaching Luke Skywalker and it's, um, great fun being back on that show. I love it because I have no responsibilities. You know, I just kind of, I just kind of show up and I'm like, Hey, I wrote myself a funny little scene where I eat a cookie, have fun teaching the kids. Well, I can speak for myself when I say I can see your sprinkling even on the newer episodes. And I'm glad I'm glad you're doing your thing, friend. You look happy. Oh. Thank you, Marcus. You're a nice guy. But thank you. It, it is a joy. Like what, what a joy, right? Like what a joy to to be a part of anything that is multi-generational like this. It feels I mean, it feels rare, you know, that we did a thing a billion years ago and now the kids that I used to talk to now have kids that watch the new thing. It's really cool. And it just feels special. It's an honor to be involved. Steve, I'm sure like millions of other people, you know, everybody done seen the viral What Happened to Steve video. Everybody done seen it. Um, and for me, I definitely cried. I'm not going to lie. But the thing that sort of hit me the most is when you reference that life has been hard. Like that's the, that one line reconnected me to you. Like it just made me feel like a kid again. Like he gets me, right? Life has been hard, you're right. And then you mentioned something about student loans and I'm like, yeah, that too. So my question for you is knowing that life is hard, what is one thing you do to stay positive? The real answer is I, I, I don't particularly try to stay positive. And I know that sounds counterintuitive and strange, but it's important to honor the reality of our feelings. And it's important to honor the reality of our situation. Right. And that's kind of what I was trying to do in that viral video was like, you know, everyone wants to feel seen you know, and everyone wants to feel respected right where they're at, you know? And that's kind of what that was. Like, I know, like, is, this is legit. Like, this has been hard, you know? And I know that you know that. Um, so I kind of look at it like the weather, right? You know, if I'm not feeling great today, I accommodate that. I'm like, all right, I'm not feeling great today. I'm not gonna try to erase my feelings. I'm not going to like fight them and try to mentally beat them into a smiley face. You know, I'm going to accommodate them and know that the, the negative way that I might be feeling right now is part of a larger picture where there are also positive feelings that will also happen. And that life is larger than any one feeling, you know? Um, and ultimately that, 
on on a longer game that is very positive you know but in but in the moment i don't necessarily i don't necessarily force myself to be positive you know i guess it's about self compassion in a way it's like so if i'm feeling bummed i'm like yeah i'm bummed i'm bummed and that's okay that i'm bummed you know i can be bummed and and there's also, you know, lots of strategies that a lot of people use. Like if I'm having a particularly negative feeling, I do the stuff where I recognize the feeling, I accommodate that, and then I get curious about it and like, hey, where does that, where do I feel that in my body? You know, and like, oh, I'm feeling bummed. I'm feeling bummed. Like this part of my eyeball feels like really like sad today. And if I like, if, if I investigate where that is, then it starts to not feel like that's not who I am. It's just an emotion that I'm having, if that yes. makes sense. I, I was an English teacher, so the weather metaphor was just everything for me, and that just kind of made things click. You know, we can't control the weather. We can't. No. And some days it rains, and so what do you do? You put on your cute little rain jacket and your umbrella, and you keep it pushing, but you don't just acknowledge it. Acknowledge it. I'm a yeah, where, where, where I live right now... Um, uh, one of my favorite things about it is there's this, just this view of this mountain, right? And I can just look out and I can see it. And there's just an old saying, right? Be the mountain, not the storm, you know? And if you think about it that way, like, you know, I watch weather go over that mountain. I watch some like nasty weather go over that mountain. I watch some beautiful weather go over that mountain. And, but that mountain is just there, right? That mountain is that mountain regardless of the weather. So... It's, uh, it's nice to live in conversation with that living metaphor, you know, so. I'll be a mountain. You be that mountain. I'll be yes. that mountain. I got a good one for you. So this one, yep. there's a little lead in. So here I go. I want to give a shout out to my favorite teacher ever. This shout out mm -hmm. is going to go to Mr. James Halfin. He taught me middle school French. I was really good at French. So good that I finished a lot of my work early. So I became disruptive. This man took it upon himself, uh, the year 2000, I was 12, um, to teach me HTML coding from scratch. I learned at 12 mm -hmm. years old in the year 2000 how to code and build websites with just HTML, with no background experience. And this was during French class. So like it had nothing to do with French, but this man saw this, this boredom and potential in me and gave me more to do. And I'm forever changed because of it, because one, I was a teacher. Two, I love technology and here I am at Cami Connect. And so James Halfin, thank you. You were a gift to me. Um, I will remember my middle school experiences positively forever because of you. Thank you. So now, Steve, it's your turn. Any teacher, any grade level, any subject, can you give that person a shout out, show them some love? I mean, first of all, that's a great story. I love that story. And this just speaks again to the the indelible power of what an educator is in society and how important they are and how irreplaceable they are. And, um, and the answer is no, because I have too many. I, I have, there, <laughs> there are many. So there's Mrs. Lawler in third grade who was like, okay, Steve can't stop making stories. So Steve can go out in the hallway for an hour uh, every day with three of his friends and write a play. She let me write a play. And I wrote a play and we performed it for everyone. That was amazing. And then there was Mr. McLaughlin in fifth grade who really kind of said um, discipline is important, right? And then there was Mr. Gott in sixth grade who uh, told me a really valuable lesson. He basically said, you have to work. doesn't matter if you're good at stuff. You know, you can't just get by because you're going to get a B probably because you're good at this one subject. That's not enough. That was a big one. And, um, and then, you know, when I was in high school, Donna Jorgensen was, uh, she was the theater teacher and she was like, dude, you gotta, 
explore this, you know? And she really pushed me to do things that I would not have done. I, in, in high school, my friend and I did a production of Edward Albee's The Zoo Story on our own. That's a crazy play to be tackling in high school. Um, you know, I had like 50 pages of lines. It was crazy. And that was very formative to me. And then, um, and I've had teachers my whole life, you know, teachers who weren't even conventional educators. Uh, my friend Wayne Coyne, who's in a band called The Flaming Lips, is one of the best teachers I've ever had, you know, and he's not even a normal educator. So the, I could just keep going, Marcus, you know, like I, I don't have one. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm realizing as I'm saying this, it's like an embarrassment of riches. I've had, I have had tremendous guidance from really wise and influential teachers in my life. And I'm extraordinarily lucky in that way. Wow. I, I have no words. I, there's so much wisdom that I just gained from chatting with you, Steve. I just appreciate you taking out the time to hang out. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. No, 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 this is absolutely my pleasure. And thank you, Marcus, and thank you to all the educators out there. You guys are so important. And um, just none of us would be anywhere without what you do. And we are so lucky to have people who hear that calling. And so thank you, Marcus, and thank you all. <laughs>